I don't power for the sake of power. It's power to do something. Yeah. It's power to be something. It's power to help. It's power to, to push. Um, and so I think when, when we when we think we're powerful just for the sake of power, just for the titles and just for the accolades, then I think you're moving into ego-driven self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining me for another episode of How To's with Tiffany. I am so glad to have you here with me today. Um, it is Thursday. I hope your week has been phenomenal. I pray that you experience the blessings and recognize the power of God um, throughout this week. And I pray that your weekend can be even better. I hope that you find rest in your weekend and peace in your weekend and all that good stuff. Okay, but before we get to the weekend, we're about to have a phenomenal conversation tonight. Um, we are still talking about power, and we actually kicked off our power season last week with a power panel. We had the amazing Dr. Christy Williams Dumas, who's no stranger to the show. She's been on before, um, as well as Coach Unitha Muhammad. And when I tell you that they laid the foundation for what we're going to be talking about this season. Um, they did that. We defined what power is. We talked about what power is not. We talked about the ways that we use it, the ways that we don't use it, why we may not use it, and all of those good things. And so if you did not get a chance to watch it last week live, go back to my YouTube channel, Tiffany Jones Blake Blake's YouTube, or How To's with Tiffany Facebook page and replay that because I promise you're going to get a lot out of it. Tonight, I am so excited about the guest that we have coming on today. She is indeed and in fact, one of the most powerful women that I know, Bishop Leah Daughtry. She, Bishop Daughtry um, is without doubt one of the most powerful women in politics. Um, she's been um, working politics in one way or another for over 20 years. And so when you talk about power, you know, you, it, politicians uh, know what power is and how to use it. And so this conversation um, is going to be a phenomenal one because not only is she in politics, but she stands at the intersection of faith and politics. And so I met Bishop Leah working with the Black Church Action Fund. The Black Church Action Fund is an organization that mobilizes faith communities and churches um, to do social justice work within their communities, within their cities, within their states. Um, and so just in witnessing the way she works, she taught me about owning my own power and how to use it to make real transformational change in our community. Okay, she's like a mentor to me, and I'm just so honored to have her on. And so just to provide a brief introduction, Bishop Leah Daughtry is a nationally recognized organizer, activist, political strategist, author, and faith leader. As I said, she stands between faith and politics, and so she works with organizations, community activists, political entities, businesses, and faith leaders to build coalitions that advance the common good. Bishop Leah is the current principal of On These Things, which is her LLC. She's a co-author of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics. She's the founder of Power Rising. Google it, Power Rising, which is 
a powerful gathering of women. Um, it happens once a year. We're going to talk a little bit more about that during this conversation. She's the co-convener of the Black Women's Leadership Collective, and she's the host of the Faithful Citizen Podcast. And so I'm telling you, this is going to be one for the books. Um, please help me welcome Bishop Leah Daltrey. Bishop Leah Daltrey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. It's so good to see you. As I was saying before the show started, you are like my mentor. <laughs> and I, I laugh because we don't talk often, but I still just learn so much from you. And I just respect the work that you do. And you've played such a role in my life. Um, just the work that we've done with the Black Church Action Fund and watching how you navigate in this world has been a blessing to me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice of you to say. I appreciate that. Of course. And so we are talking about power this season. And once I decided that I, I wanted to talk about power and women and um, how we um, show our power or how we give our power away, I had to pull on the Bishop Leah Daltrey. You've done so much that shows your power um, from being the uh, presiding prelate of the House of the Lord Churches to being a nationally recognized long time organizer and political strategist. Um, and so I really look in, I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Me too. But before we get into it, um, I ask every guest that comes on about seeing God. Uh, I believe that uh, we often relegate God to the four walls of the church. Mm -hmm. We often kind of box God in to different spaces um, and different locations when really God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and God is constantly speaking to us and constantly wants to be seen by us if we are willing to open our eyes. And so my question to you is, where have you seen God lately? Well, you know, I'm very much in the thread or the vein that you just talked about, which is seeing God in everything, in everyone, everywhere. Uh, so it's it's very hard for me to say the last place I see God because I see God mm. all around me all of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, it's March, and uh, I'm in the nation's capital. Uh, which is the last of winter, the beginning of spring. Mm -hmm. And so as I walk around town this week and I see the bulbs of the daffodils beginning to bloom like they always do every single year, for me, that's the presence of God because, you know, no matter what the weather has been, no matter what the news is, no matter what's happening in my life, there's the consistency of the way that God has ordered the earth. And so the daffodils are gonna bloom. Mm -hmm. the tulips are gonna come up. The mm -hmm. birds are gonna sing outside my window. And those are ever present reminders to me that God lives and God moves in ways small and large. And the mm -hmm. test and the challenge for me is to stop and see. Right. And to, to, and to recognize that the tree outside my window, the birds are building their nests and now the little ones are singing and I walk mm -hmm. down the street and there are the yellow daffodils popping up yes. um, to, the, to the water and the ducks are floating and, and all of the chaos that may be happening around us, right. the consistency, the plan of God continues to unfold in ways that God designed before the foundation of time. So mm -hmm. the ducks are gonna float and the flowers are gonna bloom and the birds are gonna sing. And that's God's small way of saying, daughter, I'm still here. I'm here, I love and, it. And, it's, and I'm gonna be here and mm -hmm. stop and see. Oh, I could just shut this off right now. <laughs> Bishop, you are talking to me. I mean, just the reassurance um, knowing that no matter what we're going through, God is there, God mm -hmm. is present always. Um, it's just beautiful. Um, it's the old folks used to say, if you don't, if you can't find God, he, in all likelihood, 
He's not the one who moved. Woo! It was you. Get back in position. Oh, I love that. I love that. Stop um, it. This is beautiful. So this season, we are talking about power. Mm-hmm. And we are talking about the ways in which we as women, as Black women, either embrace our power or often give it up. And so how would you, how do you define power? So for me, my definition of power is the ability to create movement, shift, or change Mm -hmm. in an environment. And whether that is your personal environment, like your home or your body or your way of thinking, or whether it is broader in the way that at your, at your place of work or your church or yeah. your environment, power is the ability to make shifts there, to make movement there, to make change there. Um, and that's my, that's my definition of power. What do you think we usually get wrong about power? when we're thinking about it, especially women. Mm -hmm. We think that power is given to us as opposed to understanding as power as something that is innate within us. Mm. Um, Authority is given to us. Someone Mm -hmm. can give you authority to do things or not to do things, Mm -hmm. but power is innate. God is, gives us power. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what, how we choose to understand it and uh, activate it is, is the challenge. But I think we often wait, especially women, yeah. we, and we think that power is something that somebody else gives us. Mm-hmm. And, and if so, you think that, then it stumps you because you're waiting for permission. Right. You're waiting for agency when God has already given it to you. And right. God waits for you to act on the agency that God has given you. Mm. So you already have the power that you're waiting for. Yes, exactly. And so yeah. this is the way, would you say that this is the way that we give up our power? Yeah, we give it up by overlooking it, by ignoring it, and by deferring to somebody else's power. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, we overlook it because, you know, somebody else can do it or nobody told me I could, or I, you know, they seem more powerful than I, uh, way by deferring and let somebody else take the first chair, mm-hmm. let somebody else do the work that we're called to do, or that we're capable of doing that we're qualified to do. And right. so we defer decision-making to others when we're quite capable of doing those things ourselves. Uh, So, you know, so I think if women particularly, but all people could understand, (laughs) oh, excuse me, bless you, (laughs) Mm. could understand that they already have power. Yeah. Power is not something you see. Power is not something that you're given. Power is what you have. So the challenge is how do I exercise my God-given power Mm. Uh, not sit on my hands and not Mm -hmm. decide I'm not going to engage or I'm waiting for someone else to give me permission to be who God called me to be. I wonder if part of that is that we know when we activate our power that we will sometimes draw negative negative responses, negative results, haters, if you will, or people who want to um, subvert our power. As yeah, mm-hmm. and, and and of course, yeah. Jesus had haters, so yeah. what do you expect, right? God has haters. There are people yeah. who are all, all the time, in every way, in opposition to what God stands for, the values of God, the principles of God. So if, if God has haters and opposition and Jesus the Christ had haters and opposition, what do we expect? Of course yeah. you're going to have haters and opposition. But what, what does that have to do with uh, the charge you have to exercise the innate power that God has given to you and to be who God has called you to be? And what will you say to God? Mm. Can or, you go or, a little deeper with that question? 
Yeah. When, so, you know, in our tradition, we believe that there will come a day that we will speak to God face to face um, and we will be able to interact with the creator living God. And so on that day, when God asks you, what did you do with what I gave you? What will we say? Well, I was waiting for somebody to do something before. It's, it's the parable, Tiffany, of the talents. Mm where God gives some one, some three, some five, and each one does a different thing with their talent. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the end, you account for what you did. So either you took the three and you multiplied, or you took the five, or, or you're like the one, the person who got the one talent who buried in the ground and said, well, I was right. doing something. So mm -hmm. I believe that's part of what we will talk about with God when we see God. And God says, well, what did you, what did, tell me, tell me what you did. Wow. But you know, what's amazing that I didn't think about until you just brought that up. I've heard that parable hundreds of times, but what I didn't think about is the amount of agency that the people who actually got up and did something with the talent had to show. Exactly. You didn't say go ask such and such and so-and-so what to do with your talent. He gave it to you knowing that at some point you have to give yourself permission to use the talent that was given to you. That's exactly right. And, and, and you go to the text. That's exactly what it says. They were given these talents and the person who gave them to you says, OK, I'll be back. I'm going away. I'll be back. See what you can do with this. And each mm -hmm. one made a decision about mm -hmm. what they would do with what they had. Yeah. And unfortunately, there was one who said, I don't know, and I don't want to mess this up. It wasn't out of disobedience. Mm -hmm. It was out of fear. And I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to lose what I have. So let me just mm -hmm. put it in the ground. Mm -hmm. and at least I know where it is. And when the, when the man comes back, I'll say, here it is. Uh, and so you haven't really done anything with it besides bury it. Whereas the other two said, well, let me see. Maybe I'll plant a vineyard. Maybe I'll plant a tree. Maybe I'll make lemonade. Maybe I'll sell, you know, cookies. This is right. what I'm going to do with this gift that I've been given. Uh, and I think that ultimately that's that we will have to, as, as believers, have that conversation with God when we see God and, and, and answer the question, uh, what did you do with what I gave you? Wow. So I just want to emphasize that the very... Um, the act of giving you the gift, the act of God giving you the talent is giving you permission to use that gift and use that talent in the way that you see fit. So Please all start. of us who wait for permission to do what we feel God is calling us in our heart to do have to understand that we already have that permission. The permission was given to you when the talent was given to you. Exactly. Exactly. In the act of giving you the talent, God gives you the permission. And in a sense, gives you the authority to mm -hmm. use what God has given you. What God has given you, if we put it in, a, in the terms of a power conversation, God has given you a measure of power. With that power comes authority, mm -hmm. agency to do something with the power that you've been given. And you choose how to exercise that agency or not. Mm -hmm. But not how not to exercise the agency. You can choose not to exercise the agency. But in but it's but the, the power transfer mm -hmm. comes with the authority to exercise the power. So when you talk about authority, could you go a little deeper in that concept and how it relates to, to power? So Authority is another word for is permission. Uh -huh. So when I was, I worked uh, as chief of staff at the U.S. Department of Labor for several years. I was not the secretary of labor. The secretary is the confirmed head of the agency, but mm -hmm. I was her chief. And she delegated her authority to me to sign letters, to act on her behalf. It mm -hmm. was not my power. The power was hers. But she delegated some power. Mm -hmm. She delegated authority to me to act in her name, understanding that her name carried power. Mm -hmm. So I signed letters. 
I executed personnel actions. I signed her name to things because my name meant nothing. It was her name that was the activating power. That was, the, that was the power holder. So I would sign her and I had permission to do that. She delegated the authority to me to do that. So yeah. when we talk about in the spiritual realm, God gives to us a measure of power, but, but, but the authority we also have to exercise that power, to call things out, to heal, mm -hmm. to deliver, mm -hmm. to cast out, to make things happen in the authority of the name of the one who gave us power. Right. And it's important to understand in the case of the secretary of labor, she got the power as a result of being confirmed by the United States government. So the ultimate authority was the United States government who gave to her power to act as mm -hmm. the secretary of labor. Mm -hmm. God uh, gives us power to act as his children, there's a measure yeah. of power that comes with the association, with the relationship, with the right. commitment that God has to us and that we have to God. And then he says, not only do you have power, but you have the authority to act in my name, right. to speak in my name, mm -hmm. to do things in my name, to cast out in my name, to heal mm -hmm. in my name, to stand in my name. Mm -hmm. And move things forward. And in that way, power and authority go together. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's that's what I'm trying to convey here. No, I think that's beautiful. I think that in and, in and of itself is powerful. And so I think in my mind, it's like the question that we often ask is, who are we to display this power? Or who are we to walk in our authority? But really the question is, who are you not who are you to not? do that? because it's already expected for you to do it. Exactly. And as, as, as believers, what we understand is our power is delegated to us because of our relationship with the most high God. Now, when we are out of relationship, mm -hmm. then that power dynamic may shift because mm -hmm. if you're not in relationship with the power giver, then you have no authority. People in Russia cannot claim the authority of the United States. They're not in relationship with us in a way for us to delegate power to them. So the yeah. power and the delegation and the authority comes because of the relationship that we have with God, who then says, you have power to do this mm -hmm. and you, have my, you can use my name and my authority to do these things. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I love this conversation. Um, as mentioned in the beginning of this uh, conversation, we talked about how sometimes people, women particularly, may not use that power and use that authority because they don't want to be seen or they don't want the hate that comes with it. Mm -hmm. You are without a doubt one of the most powerful people in American politics, women, men, People, have, it doesn't matter. You are one of the most powerful people. Um, but tell us, first, tell us a little bit about your journey in getting to where you are now. And then what I really want to hear about is how do you, um, how do you navigate when people that, I'm, when people give you hate? Because I'm sure in your position, you have gotten hate you have gotten people who try and subvert it. Um, and so if you could just speak to those two things. Tell me the first one again. Oh, first, tell us a little bit. I know this probably should be two different questions, but my mind is going so fast. Tell us about your journey to getting to where you are right now. So I was raised in church. Mm -hmm. I'm a fifth generation pastor in mm -hmm. uh, our church is an activist Pentecostal community, which means that we understood our role um, to be of being church people to see the church as the community and not simply what happens inside the four walls of our building. Uh, and because of that understanding our, and our theological understanding of who God is and where God is and what God expects from us, it meant that we were engaged in much of the political um, uh, uh, community activism work 
of our community. So I grew up understanding that I had a responsibility to the people that I served, whether they were members of our church or not, uh, the, the people, God's people. Uh, and so, you know, when you when you grow up that way and your church is, our church was a hub of activism. So all kinds of activists, you know, big names and little names mm -hmm. uh, flowed through and on, on any given Sunday, you know, um, one of my favorites, I called him my godfather, was uh, Stokely Carmichael, who changed his name to Kwame Ture. So if he was in the States, he was in church. Mm -hmm. He was in the States. If he was in New York, he'd come up the back, the side steps, and he had his favorite seat, and he'd sit there. And then he'd go down to the fellowship hall and eat whatever the sisters were serving. But to be in conversation with those kinds of people helped broaden uh, my own religious understanding, my Christian understanding of how I could um, use the authority and the power that I had been given as a child of God to help make change in the communities where um, where people's agency was being challenged. Their humanity was being challenged uh, every day. So I pursued, you know, my father and my mom said, you, you choose whatever career you want that makes you happy as long as you follow the family motto, which is love God, love the people, serve God, serve the people. Mm. Uh, so do what you want. And so I found myself um, quite accidentally, it wasn't planned, in a, in a career of uh, political action. Uh, and I, to use politics, electoral politics, I'd like to make that differentiation as a means toward uh, helping people achieve uh, their God-given, God-destined um, life. Uh, so, so I pursued that path. I worked on. I think this cycle would be my tenth presidential campaign. Wow! I've worked on every presidential campaign since 1984, and Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, and I really, and it's real. I've worked on Capitol Hill. I've worked in the executive branch, obviously at the uh, Department of Labor. I've worked for every branch of the government except the judiciary. Mm. So it's given me an opportunity to help to make change for the people that I'm called to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how, that's how I kind of got that's into amazing. it. That's amazing. That's amazing. So did you recognize your power early on? It sounds no. like being in that environment. No, no, no. It's something you I had just, to grow into. Listen, I had to grow. And listen, I was just a, a PK. I'm the oldest kid. I'm just a PK doing what PKs do, you know, you know how that is, opening the church, turning on the mm -hmm. mic, fry the chicken, fry the chicken, serve the chicken, clean up the <laughs> raise the offering, count the offering, take right. the money, usher, junior, quite all of that. Everything. Make, do the bulletin, all of those things that you do as a, as a PK to serve, mm -hmm. uh, just in case nobody else shows up, right? You, <laughs> you have yep. to be. Sometimes it's just you. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's just you and dad. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's what it is. Right. Uh, so, so my life was a life of service. And I didn't think of myself as being powerful in and of myself. I was gifted. I, uh, I have the gift of administration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was gifted to serve leaders and to help see the, the plans, the vision of leaders come to life. And mm -hmm. I very much enjoyed that. It wasn't, I think it's only been maybe in the last 10, 15 years that I've come to think of myself as powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and really it's probably because people say it often. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just I'm just a child of God, a daughter of the Most High that does the things that God calls me to do. Mm. And if that, if that leads people to say I'm powerful, then so be it. But I don't. Do you feel it, it though, or do you not feel it? I, I wonder that for people who are powerful, it's like, do you feel your power or? Are you just walking in who you are and that happens to be a powerful person? I, it's more the latter. I don't wake up every day and say, oh, I'm a powerful person. No, I wake up and say, what do I have to get done today? Yeah. 
what's my assignment for the day, whether that's a task or a person mm -hmm. or, you know, do and who, how can I move things? If it's a person, how can I move things to a support, assist, push, pull right. this person into the place where they need to be? What's my role to help? And, and, and maybe that makes me powerful because I can, sometimes I'm able to do that and press buttons and levers, but I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't think it's useful. And I, and I sort of cringe when I hear people describe themselves as powerful. It's yeah. Like, no. Yeah. If, if, it feels egalicious to me. <laughs> right. Right. And, and usually if you have to call yourself powerful, <laughs> Are you really right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm always I, I in awe that. when people when, when people say that about me. I'm always in awe, mm -hmm. and I just oh, I just try to do my part. Yeah, and do, and do and be in the place where God has called me to be. And if that makes you say I'm powerful, uh, I'm powerful mm -hmm. and okay. But I would never describe myself that way. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I can understand that though. Um, I was having a conversation with uh, Erica Campbell about power and we were talking about um, kind of self-driven self-confidence or ego-driven self-confidence versus mm -hmm. God-driven self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounded very similar to what you were saying just in terms of you know, you walk in this authority and you walk in this power, but um, if you don't stay focused on the fact that God is what's behind the things that you're doing, then you can tip over into something that's more ego driven. That's really not being beneficial or of use to anybody, but you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. I, I think that's right. And so, um, you know, I go back to my original point about the definition of power. Yeah. You know, I don't think that God gives us power for the sake of power. It's power to do something. Yeah. It's power to be something. It's power to help. It's power to, to push. Um, and so I think when, when, we, when we think we're powerful just for the sake of power, just for the titles and just for the accolades, then I think you're moving into ego-driven self-confidence. Mm -hmm. To say, well, you know, I, I'm here. I've been given power mm -hmm. to accomplish something, right? And to do something, and to be in the places where God has called me to be. And mm -hmm. so, let me exercise it that way. And I don't, you know, for me, I, I can just speak for me. Even yeah. in preaching moments, you know, it, it's probably you feel the least powerful because mm. it's, you know, and I think that's part of the shaping and the molding process. Because if you got it all together, then what you need God for? Right. <laughs> it has to be, at least for me, there's a there's a level of, I don't know if this is right. I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to say. I think I heard this right, but maybe I didn't hear it right. Right up until yeah. the, time, the microphone where you're like, all right, come on, <laughs> this is what we're doing today. This is what you gave me. I'm going to just go with this. And then yeah. it turns out to be exactly... Uh, what it is, but I think that's a that's a that's part of it, at least for me, to not no, rely on good. my own sense of what is right and what is and what is what makes sense to me, yeah. and to rely on what God is calling me to do, and to stay constantly attuned and connected to be sure that where I'm walking and what I'm about to say and how I'm presenting is the mm -hmm. best representation of the God that I serve. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I think that that's something else that sometimes we get wrong um, about it is that we feel like we, you know, power looks like us feeling like everything, like we know what to do in all situations when we don't. We don't. And so I think that it's refreshing to hear someone who has accomplished all that you have and steadily doing the work to say there are times that I'm not even sure, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that, yeah, I think yeah. That that's very refreshing to hear. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, and I think it's a bit of a learning process and a bit of growing to know yourself 
and growing the relationship with the power giver, with God, so you know, you know how to maneuver. And 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 sometimes I go into meetings when I was serving as CEO of conventions, and you know, you're meeting with these corporate CEOs and uh, and you're trying to make deals and and so forth. And it's like the last thing I want to do or be, and because I'm not all that sharp edged. Uh, in those kinds of settings, but it's like, I describe it as putting on a garment. Okay, I gotta do this. This is yeah. what I gotta do. So come on, let me uh, buck up. Come on, Leo, buck up. This is what you gotta uh-huh. do today. You gotta be a CEO. So we gonna be a CEO and right. walk into this meeting and be a boss. I love uh, it. When I'd rather be sitting in my office talking to the staff about whatever their trouble is for the day. But <laughs> that's what this moment calls for uh, a different it calls for um, Deborah the prophetess mm. and not not Deborah the wife of Lapidoth, right? And you gotta you gotta shift, you gotta move, you gotta be. You don't have you gotta be different people sometimes. You gotta be yeah. different. You gotta wear different robes and mm. rise to that moment for what that moment calls for. And it's all the same exercise of power and authority, but it may feel and look differently. That's really good. Power can feel and look different in different situations. Yeah. So what looks like power um, when you're with the CEOs may look different. At church. Right. Or with when your family. The mother blue, and you know, mm-hmm. or, or sister, sister Jones or brother, you know, whatever, you know, yep. or, or church mothers that raised me. Yeah. I am the head of the church, but, um, that's the lady that raised me. So yes, ma'am. Exactly. Can I get you a plate? <laughs> right. That's so good. Yeah, that's I'm really still good. the bishop, but it's it's a different role. And they wouldn't say that I'm not, but I I recognize that power in that moment looks differently looks and different. feels differently and mm-hmm. acts differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's really good. It gives it gives. I know it gives me a lot to think about. Um, just in terms of, of having a one dimensional uh, definition and a one dimensional um, concept of how it plays out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's really good. That's also where women get stuck mm-hmm. because we think it needs to look the same all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're allowed to pivot. We're allowed to show and exercise and demonstrate power differently. It doesn't always look and feel the same and that's okay Mm -hmm. it doesn't change the vessel because the vessel's pouring oil or vessel's pouring water it's the same Mm. it's just is this is this is a moment for water it's like when you get sometimes you just want water right sometimes you want a diet coke or you want your ginger ale right it's just the time calls for something different and it's okay to pivot and it's okay to uh, adjust to the demands of the moment. Hmm. That's good. That's good, Bishop. Um, so you talked about how Christianity or your church setting plays a role in even the work that you do right now. Would you say that Christians have a responsibility to get involved civically? Absolutely. Until uh, we get to the other side of glory. Yeah. We are people living in a society that requires salt and light, that is screaming for salt and light. Mm-hmm. And if we are not going to be the ones to say, that, to call a system demonic, yeah, and to, call, and to challenge things that go against the ethos of God, then who's going to do it? I think we have narrowly defined what God's interests are. Mm. Narrowly defined God's interests to who's saved, who got the Holy Ghost, and what church they go to. Mm-hmm. When really, if we are following the biblical text, God's interests are so much broader. In Micah, he says, I have shown you, old man, what is good, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The question mm-hmm. is, where is God walking? Mm. God only walking inside of our church? No. God, what is, where is, God is under the bridge with the Haitians. 
Mm-hmm. God is in the camps with the with the migrants who have crossed who have walked hundreds of miles to cross borders. God is with the migrants who are on the bus getting shipped to who knows where. Can right. we say that God is not there? The least, the last, the lost, not mm-hmm. just in spiritual terms. But in physical terms, where is God walking? And if God is walking there, that's where the church should be. Mm. That's where believers should be. We cannot divorce ourselves from the least, the last, the lost, the locked out, the left behind, because they have not walked in the four do- in, inside the doors of our church. And so that, I believe, is what God is calling us to, to be God's witness in the places where we minister to the communities where we uh, are located. Do we really think that we come into a community, have church and go home, stepping over the homeless people on, on the way? And we think God's okay with that because we had a high time in the Lord? No, no. We are called to be salt and light. We're called to be witnesses, not only inside the building. Remember the old churches in, in biblical times, there was no building. Right. Those, those, those New Testament churches were in people's homes. We didn't have this, this idea of church that we have now. And their witness was in the community, how they lived and what they did and, and creating the Azusa community, for example, in the New mm. Testament was how people knew they were Christians. Mm because how they interacted in the world around them. And I think that's what God calls us to. And if we we aren't doing that, we're falling short of our witness. So how do we, how do churches get back to that? What what is what is missing? What, What is it that we, and maybe nothing's missing. I don't know. How do we get back to that? I think, you know, and, I, and I'm glad you asked that because we tend to think it's this big thing we've got to do. Yeah. And it's not. It is an awareness of what's happening in the community. Who is the community mm. that you're serving? Where is your church mm-hmm. located? What does it look like? Who are the people? Right. Do we know who the people are? What And then what can we do inside of our church to attract people around something other than come to church on Sunday? Maybe you're living in a community with a lot of children who are latchkey kids. Maybe there's something you can do with that. Maybe you're living in a food desert. Maybe your building is in a food desert. How about a food pantry? How about free meals on Sunday? How about uh, uh, health care clinics in the church? Let the nurses from the hospital come take people blood pressure. We Showing a concern about these things, but they're not only a food pantry. Yeah. But the next step of challenging food policy, why are there food deserts in the place where you're serving? Why Mm -hmm. can't we get fresh vegetables? Because of the food policy of our government, which apportions food and creates barriers or Mm -hmm. takes down barriers to ensure that we have fresh produce, the things that make for life. So yes, have the food pantry, but the food pantry wouldn't be necessary if we had good food policy. Exactly. Let's not just serve the fish. Let's teach the people to fish by yes. challenging, going to your congressman and say, we need a different food policy. You don't have to know every issue. Pick one. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do everything. Pick one thing that you want to land on and help the people be smarter. And the last thing I'll say about that is a caution to leaders because we think we have to do it. I don't know anything about food policy. You don't have to. There's somebody else who does. Go find them. Uh. There's some orga- other organization who knows about health care, who knows about diabetes, who knows about prostate cancer, who knows about food policy. Bring them in. Yes. Help your people be smarter. You don't have to add another thing to your list. Somebody else can help you. And in that sense, we then live out the scripture that talks about if some were the hearing, where were the, you know, we're eyes, we're all members. Yeah. Of the body of Christ. We don't all have to be the eyes. We don't all have to be the ears. We don't all mm-hmm. have to be the legs. We each have a role and responsibility to make a complete body. So yeah. reach, out to, reach out to people and say, I need you to come to my church. Mm-hmm. And talk about uh, health care and prostate cancer or COVID or what should we know now? Very simple things that raise the awareness of us and help us as believers to be smarter about the issues that are surrounding our community and how we can be the best representative 
of God and God's intention for us to be in health and to prosper even as our souls prosper. Yes, that's so good. And even in talking about the topic that we are, to collaborate with other people, that's not giving up your power. No, it's not. And in many cases, it's expanding it. It's adding it's to it. the circle bigger. Right. You're more people in to the mm-hmm. circle of love and the circle of, of care and expression of who God is by, right. by bringing other folks in. Why not? Right. 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 The more the merrier. I, th- <laughs> I think sometimes we believe that when we let people in, it takes away from, from us and what we're doing. But if your mind is, if your mind is right, then you're going to understand that, as you said, the more the merrier, we're all working towards getting this issue taken care of. And what collaborating does is actually help us to build the power that it's going to take to get there. And, and then I'll add to that, Tiffany, that's exactly right. But if you think that bringing someone else in takes away your power, then yeah. you are questioning the power giver. Ah, that the that the power giver can somehow that the power that God has given you can somehow be diminished by somebody else who also got their power from God, right? right. So you're questioning the inexhaustible supply, yeah. That as if God's power is limited, mm-hmm. and as if God has you know ten ounces of power, and if you if you share your one ounce with somebody. That's not how God works. It's an inexhaustible supply. And what God gives to you cannot be diminished. It can only be multiplied. Yes. Sharing it, bringing someone else in doesn't diminish you. It exalts you, really. I love that. But it speaks to the scarcity mindset that we often have as it relates to that. That's right. Like it's only enough for so many people. Yes. As if we all don't have it. That's right. That's that theology of scarcity right. versus the theology of sufficiency. Mm. You know, that well, says Bishop, always enough. I could talk to you for an hour or so longer <laughs> about this, um, but I do want to start. I want to start wrapping it up. Um, I know that there are women and people in general who don't recognize the power that we have don't even know where to start. We may have a burden, but don't feel like we're, we are enough or that we have enough or that we have the permission already or the authority that we talked about. What would you say to those people? So first I'd say, and that happens often there. And even for those of us who believe in that the power in the power that God has given us, there are seasons when you question it and you're not sure it's what it, what it ought to be or what it should be. So one, just press pause Mm. and just say to yourself, God created me and has given me power and authority. And you might have to write that on some post-it, stick it up so you can repeat it to yourself over and over. The second thing I'd suggest that you do is find a community that will affirm that with you. We're not intended to be solo individuals all by ourselves. God created us to be in community. Sometimes we need the community around us to say, girl, what you doing? Come on, let's go. You you can do this. You can be this. You are this. So let's go. And you know, we all need our, our cheering squad to say, come on now. And to help push us and pull us and to say, Girl, what's matter with you? Buck up. Let's go. We got work to do. But you need a community of, you need an amen corner around you to help you sometime walk into your destiny. You need people who go fight for you, fight with you, fight about you uh, for those moments when you're like, I don't know if this is where God is calling me. I don't believe it. I don't feel it today. I just want to stay in the bed with the covers over my head. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worthy. I don't know why. That's when your community kicks in, whether yeah. it's the community of your church or the community of your friend circle that says, come on, get out of bed. Let's go. You have work to do. God created you to do work. There is no question, but that you have the power and authority of God working in your life. So let's go. 
And if you need me to stand and to walk every step with you, I'll walk every step with you. Mm. And, you know, before I, I conclude this, I, I can't not talk about the community of Power Rising that you um, founded, that you created. Can you talk just a little bit about Power Rising and when the next conference will be? Power Rising is a community, a gathering by, for, and about Black women. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And, and the ways and the power that we have mm -hmm. and the ways that we leverage that power to better our communities. We have four pillars of work, um, health and uh, healing, uh, community empowerment, political awareness, business and economics. Um, and, and there's one more that I'm forgetting right now, but there are five, and you can find more on our website, powerrising.org, powerrising.org. Our next meeting is going to be in September, and I don't remember the dates, but we'll be in San Francisco, and we would love to see you there. We gather once or twice a year. The big gathering is about a thousand women. We keep it, we cap it so that women, you know, it, it feels a little intimate and we have a great time today. We're famous for our, uh, our dance parties yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and just women who love being women or who just need the camaraderie of a sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And so as one of our board members said, I come to Power Rising with sisters and I leave with more sisters. Ah. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing and we love to have you, but you can go on our website, learn more, see galleries of previous conferences mm -hmm. and we also have a Facebook page. Good, good, good. I'm going to have to make it my business to attend. I, I, every year I see it. And I'm like, next year I'm there and then something happens, but it's so powerful. Like I can, I can tell by the pictures and the video that that is where I need to be. And so yes, yes. that happened. It's a um, wonderful space. The last, I mean, our youngest person was uh, six months old and our oldest was 93. Wow. Women and their and daughters. And it's just a great intergenerational space for us to share and learn with one another. I love it. Well, my, my last question that I ask all of my guests um, has to do with a song that we used to sing at church. You can't make me doubt him. I know you're familiar with that. <laughs> Being the PK that you are. Yeah. Um, what is something, Bishop Leah, that nobody can make you doubt? The power and presence of God in my life and the capacity of God to be present in all the lives around me. Mm. And that that God is good and that God is always working for my good. Whether I feel it, whether I sense it, whether I know it, I know that God is good and God is working for my good every day, every minute every hour, every second. That's what I know. Thank you so much, Bishop Leah. You're bringing tears to my eyes. <laughs> Thank you so much just for your wisdom, Thank you for being here, and God bless you. Thank God bless you, you too, Dr. Tiffany. I love saying that. <laughs>